You're listening to Bonus Points, the official podcast of Mr. Astle's Theology Class. Join us as we put out into the deep and explore the world of theology and beyond. Today, we're talking about little-known, uncommon, and weird objects used for the liturgy. Let's begin. Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 36 of Bonus Points. This one is going to be pretty exciting, and this is a true bonus points. This is Today's topic is going to build directly off of something that the seniors are doing in class this week. So before we get into that, make sure you like this show, rate the show, share the show, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, and check out our website, bonuspointspodcast.com. Anyway, I mentioned that this is a bonus, a true bonus points episode because it's building on something that's being done in the classroom. Now, the seniors in the fall take sacraments. I think I mentioned that a couple episodes ago. But one of the things we're doing at the start of the school year here, these first few weeks, we're talking about how important the physical world is when it comes to the spiritual, how the church is a liturgical community, how we have these rituals, not just because we need something to do on Sunday, but because they reveal something important and their encounters with God. So one of the things we're doing as part of this is we're talking about all the different objects and vestments and devices and parts of a church building. I'm throwing so much vocabulary at them, you guys. Um, if you are one of the seniors listening to this, sorry, not not that sorry, but it is a lot of lot of terms. Now, many of these things are objects that you have seen before. You see every week. Many of them we use every single time we say Mass. But I thought for today's episode, we would look at some less common things. These are objects and um, instruments that you probably won't see out there unless you go looking for it. So you would, you, it shouldn't be surprising that after 2,000 years, there have been some strange things that have come up. So today we're going to talk about some of those. Specifically, I've picked five obscure devices or instruments used in the liturgy. The first one is the maniple. The second is the crotalus. We have the fistula and the ferula, and then finally the liturgical pincers. Uh, And I put these in rough order of how likely you are to find them in the wild, starting with the most common down to one that If you do see it out there, let me know. I'd be very surprised. So the first one is a vestment called the maniple. This is the one that you're most likely to run into because it is still worn at every traditional Latin mass. So if you ever go to a Latin mass, you will see a maniple being worn. Now, let's back up and talk about vestments for a second. Vestments are the special clothes worn by the ministers during the liturgy. They do this for a couple reasons. Primarily, vestments remind us that the priest is not acting as himself in the liturgy, but he's acting in persona Christi, meaning in the person of Christ. The vestments literally cover him up to represent how his own personality is not really what's important here. The individual vestments also have a lot of symbolic meaning. So this is another thing that the seniors are doing this week and next week is we're going through those vestments and and talking about what each piece means, what each garment symbolizes. Well, the maniple um, is one that we're not talking about because you don't usually see it worn today, but the maniple is similar to the stole. So the the stole still is used today. You may know what it is. The stole is a long strip of cloth that is worn over the shoulder. So it looks kind of like a scarf. Um, It's always colored for the liturgical season. So right now, as I'm recording this, we are in ordinary time. So the stole is green normally. The maniple is similar to the stole, but it's a lot shorter. So it instead of, I mean, the stole is a couple feet long worn over the shoulders. The maniple is maybe a foot or two long. And it's It's worn on the left forearm, so it hangs on the left forearm, and usually it's kept in place by either a pin or some elastic. So let's go back. Where does this come from? In the Roman Rite, 
a lot of our vestments go back to what Romans wore, which makes sense when you think about it. Now, in ancient Rome, it was common for people to carry a handkerchief in their left hand when they were out and about. They would use this to wipe sweat away or tears or whatever. Um, And sometimes they would tie it around their forearm instead of carrying it. Now, over time, it became more decorative than functional, kind of like a pocket square in a suit or tuxedo. And so it would be very brightly colored. That makes it into our vestments as the maniple, this long strip of cloth colored for the liturgical day, worn on the left forearm. Now, because of this origin story, the maniple symbolizes the labors of the priesthood. And it reminds the priest that the difficulties he encounters now will lead to an eternal reward. To quote a psalm here, those who sow in tears will reap rejoicing. In fact, so there we have what's called vesting prayers, prayers that are said as the priest puts on each vestment. Here's the one that goes with the maniple. The priest prays, May I deserve, O Lord, to bear the maniple of weeping and sorrow, in order that I may joyfully reap the reward of my labors. The maniple fell out of use after Vatican II, but it was never officially suppressed or abrogated, so nobody ever said you had to stop wearing it. They just stopped saying that you did have to wear it. So this one, if you know where to look, still pretty common today. Our next device is called the Crotalus, which is a cool name for anything. I also learned in the course of my research, it is the name of a heavy metal band, I think. Um, the Crotalus only makes an appearance during the Paschal Triduum, those three days before Easter where we commemorate the Passion. So even if it were commonly used today, you'd still only see it one time of the year. During the Triduum, we have Holy Thursday where we commemorate the Last Supper. After the Gloria on Holy Thursday, so that that Gloria canticle, from that point until we sing the Gloria again, During the Easter Vigil, we do not use bells. The bells of the church are silenced because they're joyful and melodious. And during the Triduum, we're commemorating the Passion of Christ. And so we we don't use bells. Now, you might also know that during some parts of the Mass, we normally ring bells. Specifically, during the Eucharistic prayer, when the priest calls down the Holy Spirit, we ring of the bells. And then again, when he elevates the host and elevates the chalice, we ring the bells again. We do that because it's important to signal to the congregation that something important is happening. In fact, for much of history, the Eucharistic prayer was whispered. So that was how you knew that something important was going on. How do you mark this important moment on a day when you're not allowed to use the bells? Enter the Crotalus. So the crotalus is a wooden device that would be used by the altar servers. And it has a few variations, but the most common form looks kind of like a, a wooden clacker. It has a small small wooden hammer on a hinge and then two flatter pieces of wood that it can smack against. Or think of um, the kind of clacker that you get as a party favor that has the, the hands and you, you shake it and it rattles, and and whatever form it takes, whenever the crotalus is swung, spun, or waved, it makes this really loud clacking sound. And so when it's used, it's used in the same way that bells would be used in a normal mass if it wasn't the triduum. So if you want to learn more about the triduum liturgies, by the way, go back and listen to episodes 16 and 17. The word crotalus comes from the Greek word crotalon, which means rattle. So it makes sense. These are becoming more and more popular as more and more young people are rediscovering some of the traditions that were lost in the second half of the 20th century. So each year, which with each passing year's triduum, you're more likely to see one of these out and about. The next one is the fistula, also called the reed or the papal straw. Um, This is a golden straw used to drink the precious blood from the chalice. And you might be thinking, a straw like like a, a drinking straw? Yeah, like a drinking straw. This, uh, it, when it started, it was mostly practical, right? So many things in the liturgy are both practical and symbolic. 
The fistula leans more towards the practical. It was used because it was less likely that a drop of the precious blood would be spilled if you were drinking it through the straw rather than picking up the chalice. It's called the papal straw because by the early modern period, it was really only seen used in the Pope's liturgies. This happens commonly with liturgical practices. You have something that was widespread and it kind of falls out of use, but it is kept in the Pope's liturgies. So when, it, when the fistula first shows up in the 8th century, it was very, very common. Over time, though, it, it fell away until it was really just the Pope using it. So it was never a... It was never something that was super duper special because the Pope is super duper special. It was just he kept this tradition when most other places did not. This device, the fistula of the papal straw, has been used as recently as Pope Paul VI in the late 1960s. So while you won't see it if you go to Vatican City today, you never know. It might make a comeback. This next one is really out there. So first of all, unlike everything else we've talked about today, this one is not used for the mass. It's used for confession. It's called the ferula, the virga, the becchetto, becchetto penitenziario, or the penitential wand. Now I know what you're thinking, and no, wand here does not refer to magic. The word wand just means stick. But magic wand sounds a lot cooler than magic stick, so that's what we call it. But the ferula is a long stick associated with penance. And no, it was not a long stick used to beat sinners over the head as a form of penance. So let's back up and talk about penance for a second. Christ gives the apostles the authority to bind and loose, to forgive or not forgive sins. This is what happens in confession. The church exercises that authority given by Christ to forgive sins. Because Christ initially said that to the apostles, at first only bishops could hear confessions because they were the successors of the apostles. Now, as the church grows, they delegate some of that authority to priests. So priests are able to hear confessions, they're able to absolve some sins. But some super serious sins were reserved to the bishop, meaning the priest could hear your confession, but he would say, I'm not allowed to absolve this, you got to go to the bishop. Um... Some of them were resolved, or some of them were reserved rather, to a guy in Rome called the Major Penitentiary, or even to the Pope himself. By the way, this is still the case today. While priests have been given authority to absolve a lot of serious sins that maybe they weren't able to in the past, there are still some things that can only be absolved by a bishop or even by the Pope. Stay tuned for an upcoming episode about. Um, not quite this topic, but this will come up in a future episode, so stay tuned. Anyway, so there was this custom that developed in Rome where the major penitentiary, this, this official who has authority to absolve basically any sin, he would have this long stick, and if you made a penitential pilgrimage to Rome, he would tap you on the head with it. So you make a pilgrimage to Rome as an act of penance, you go to the major penitentiary's church, he's sitting in this big chair. As a way of acknowledging that you have completed your pilgrimage, he would reach out with this long stick and just boop. We're not totally sure how this practice developed. The best explanation that I've heard is that it's based on Psalm 23. You know, the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. One of the lines in that psalm says, uh, with your rod and your staff, you have comforted me. And so the idea is that, oh, that, that developed into the stick that they would tap penitents on the head. Um, kind of weird. I'm not going to like, I'm not going to lie. That's a weird thing. Whether that's the explanation or not. Uh, so eventually it falls out of use. They would take the penance rod and attach it to the outside of the confessional. Kind of like you might see a sword displayed over a fireplace, I guess. And some of them are still there today. So while they're not used anymore, if you know where to look in Rome, you might still see a ferula attached to the outside of a confessional. Our last example is actually a category of objects, and they would have been super duper helpful in 2020. I don't know why we didn't bring them back. They're called liturgical pincers or cochleas or host spoons. 
These were gold devices used to hold the Eucharist. When it's pincers, they look like, well, pincers. Think of a pair of forceps or a pair of scissors with flat pads instead of blades. They were originally used for intinction, which is where you take the host and dip it into the precious blood. Pincers would be used instead of your fingers to, to intinct, to dip the host into the precious blood. They became super popular, though, during the plague, where you could use these devices to give communion, um, especially if it was last rites, to a plague victim without touching them. So during the plague, we also see this device called the cochlear or the host spoon. This was a long metal rod, I'm talking like three or four feet, with either a spoon or a lunette at the end, like a flat circle at the end. You'd put the host on it, and then the priest could extend, extend the cochlear through the window of a quarantined plague victim's house so that they could receive communion without even leaving their house. I think, man, we, we could have used those. Where were those? Where were all of the cochleas? Where were all of the pincers back in 2020? So the fact that we didn't see these devices when we were quarantined, that says to me that they're not coming back. If they were going to come back, that would have been the moment. So unfortunately, I don't think that you'll be seeing liturgical pincers anywhere but a museum anytime soon. So what's our takeaway here? Why should we care about any of this? Well, this should remind us that the liturgy is important. It's not just a set of arbitrary rituals. It's the worship of God. The sacraments make visible the invisible. They're encounters with God's very life, with God's grace. The way that we dress and act during the liturgy is important, both for us and for the priest. Everything has a purpose. Everything means something. Think of how many of these devices were used for the Eucharist to prevent the Eucharist from falling or to make sure that those who were dying had the comfort of the sacraments. All of that testifies to our belief in the real presence, that the Eucharist is the body of Christ. Even something like the maniple has this really deep symbolism with it. It reminds the priest who he is. It reminds him why he's doing this. Like, why is he going through all these labors every single day? It, remind, it reminds him what he's working for. Every time he puts it on, he's reminded. Some of the things that we use in the liturgy or have used in the past may seem strange, but ultimately they should remind us that the liturgy is not about us. So what resources can I leave you with today? First of all, I'm linking to a copy of the Vesting Prayers that we mentioned in the context of the Maniple. You can read the prayers that accompany all of the vestments, along with some explanations of where they come from. I'm linking to the Catholic Encyclopedia's article on the Maniple, so you can get a little bit more of the historical context. I'm also linking to a Catholic liturgicals shop where you can see Maniples. They, they have some good pictures. I guess you could buy one if you wanted to but you can see what a maniple looks like. I have a few different articles about the Crotalus, both from a, a, a website called Liturgical Arts Journal and from Church Pop. What I like about these articles is they not only have pictures, but they also include videos so you can hear what the Crotalus sounds like for yourself. I have two different Liturgical Arts Journals that mention the fistula, the papal spoon, including pictures of it being used by Pope Paul VI back in the 1960s. I have a post from a priest's blog where he talks about the ferula and goes into the history of the penance wand. And finally, a liturgical arts journal that came out during the pandemic about obscure devices associated with the Eucharist, and it mentions those liturgical pincers. So that's going to do it for our episode today. As always, please remember to rate this podcast wherever you're listening to it, share this episode, share the show, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. Why? Because it helps this show reach more people. And I think we talk about some interesting stuff here. I think there are lots of people out there who would also be interested. And so when you like, when you subscribe, when you share, it helps the show reach more people. Anyway, that's my sales pitch. That's going to do it for today's episode. I'm Mr. Astle. Thank you for joining us once again, as we put out into the deep to explore the world of theology and beyond.